have you did you know that there was a case at the Supreme Court right now on like the Supreme Court is about to make their decision on whether or not um a local government can put into law rules that would remove homeless people um prevent camping for homeless people remove them to where that's the problem. Can, <laughs> no, 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 no. So the fundamental question is, can homeless people, people experiencing homelessness, can a city uh, create a law that makes it illegal for them to sleep outside with a blanket um, if they don't provide shelter, bed, enough bed? And it looks like the Supreme Court about to say absolutely they can. So what are you going to do with them? They, and if every city, this is unlikely to happen, but if every city says yes, you can do that, and they do that. Then there's no way for these people to go. So you're gonna leave them locked up. Like I'm, I'm very confused. Yeah, I mean the decision will be th- th- they'll provide a decision probably next month or like sometime this summer. Um, I'm, not, I'm gonna go into this case. I was not aware of that. That is, you know, the, I, the the criminalization of homelessness is such a fascinating thing to me because what exactly like when you think of what crimes are right like there are things that are harmful to others things that are harmful to society and so we've determined like these things cannot be done because they cause harm to others they make society less safe and therefore you see like we can you know incarcerate people for crimes and i just don't see how homelessness falls into that category of like a harm to others or oh people. that's the that's the issue so the there was a previous the, i'll send you the video after okay um there's a um, a previous case around drugs uh, and drug addicts that says that you cannot criminal criminalize a status, i.e., a person addiction to drugs, right. but you can criminalize the action, right? The okay, the act of taking drugs. the drugs. Okay, so yeah. what's the action in, in the homelessness context? Sleeping outside. The so issue. What's the that, harm there? Um, well, it doesn't matter about the harm. We'll get to what the homelessness brings. The issue is if the conduct can be criminalized, i.e., sleeping outside. Um, are you sort of moving aside and bifurcating your duty and saying, I can't criminalize status, but I'm going to use a conduct that is so intrinsically linked to to a status um, to get around it? Um, And the question is, is like sleeping so fundamental, sleeping outside so fundamental to being homeless that it is one in the same, the conduct and the status kind of um, fall into each other? Um, I mean, what if I'm not sleeping? Hmm? What if I'm not sleeping? If you're not sleeping with a blanket, then you're not doing anything illegal. So just don't sleep? <laughs> no, but, okay, so that's the issue, though. Like, what you are doing is a human biological behavior. You have to sleep. Yes, but they can dictate where, where you, sleep? you sleep. So this could have been a time, place, kind of, time, place, manner kind of argument, but it's an Eighth Amendment argument. So if I'm sitting waiting for the bus to go home and I'm exhausted and I end up falling asleep at the bus stop, can I be incarcerated for that? Because Probably I felt- not, because there's be discretion um, on the part of the police officer. Um, and you can argue that you fell asleep as opposed to I'm homeless and I'm sleeping. And you don't have a blanket on... Uh, I don't on- know, okay. Hey all, welcome back to Thema Sintolt. Grab your coffee, water, tea, whatever you're drinking, go and get that. Today we will be talking about homelessness. So, how do I start this? A little story about a naive little themist. Growing up in Jamaica, I've always thought about the US as the land of opportunities. I bought into the ideas told to us on the TV, right? As a child, I did not believe that there was poverty in America, and I definitely did not believe that there were homeless people in America. Coming to the US did very little to change this, actually, because the neighborhood I first lived in was posh. My brother and I were introduced to a kind of bubble, if you will, and bubble in the most brainwashy sense of the word possible. To continue to believe in the sort of American dream, our parents made it a point to prevent us from seeing anything or being a part of anything that would indicate that we weren't upper middle class or upper class, right? And we did not get to see the kind of work that my parents put in to creating this, what I believe now is a facade. Poverty did not exist in my mind when I was in the US. It only existed in America. I'll get to that in a minute. So imagine my surprise after about a year or two as a child in America, passing women, children, men, in the rain and the cold as my mother 
brought us to the safety of our own home. I was shocked. I was shocked not only to see that, but on a different occasion to see an elder lady with a blanket in the snow, cuddled up, trying to escape the elements. Unfortunately, she couldn't. And I knew at the time that a woman in the cold, in the snow with a blanket was just not acceptable. I didn't have any power though. So I did what most children would do and I cried. I cried, cried, and then cried some more. And I asked my mom, how do you live like this while other people live like that? And why is this happening in the US? Like, the US is the pinnacle of success and power. The American dream was sold to me and I bought in hook, line, and sinker. As a child, again, I saw the US as this paradise where everything is possible and everyone got everything that they needed. In fact, the Hunger Games for me represented the world where Everywhere else were districts, and then the U.S. would be the capital, where everyone is rich and flamboyant in the capital. That was not the case. I do not remember when it is or was that I stopped reacting to people facing homelessness, but I know I did. I had to. For me to live and survive in the world, my mental health required that I created a sort of callous to the experience of others, the experience of people facing and living through homelessness. I had to, again, to live... And I also had to recognize that American homelessness was very different than Jamaican homelessness. The climate in the United States is unforgiving. The weather in Jamaica is more forgiving, but also there's a separate element in Jamaica when we think about homelessness and excuse the language and the pejorative of being used in this way, but I'm trying to reflect exactly how people see homeless people in Jamaica. They are called, quote unquote, crazy or crazy people. So, after viewing Alicia's video, in conjunction with the Supreme Court case where oral arguments just occurred about what to do with homelessness and how do you fight homelessness, whether or not the government can kick people out of the cities and states that are facing homelessness. After listening to that case and hearing Alicia, I now think we should discuss it. So here's what Alicia had to say about poverty first. You also blame yourself for being poor not an evil or corrupt system. You blame yourself, not the system, right? That thrives off of poor people. You forget that you were put there, right? Or you don't know. You don't know that you were put there. There are a lot of people trying to escape wage slavery and poverty and capitalism who don't know that it's not their fault, that they could have done all the right things. And it's by chance that you ended up in the home and the family that you were raised in. There's a statistic, and I have to look it up to get the details, but there's a statistic to say that most people born into poverty will stay in poverty. Why do you think that is? Do you really think it's because of choices? Do you really think it's because of your wrongdoing, your being um, unwise with money or not a good steward? We're victim blaming a lot of impoverished people and we also victim blame ourselves. We also uh, gaslight ourselves into saying, oh, it's my fault that I'm here. And if we do fall onto hard times, because we live in a society where people say, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, which is not a thing, right? We say that that is ours. We are less likely to ask for help, right? Because we feel like it is some moral failure that we have, we have committed, which is why we're poor. We blame ourselves for being poor and not the systems that make us poor, right? So if you watch that video, Alicia hints at meritocracy, which we will discuss, and how hard we are with people who are facing homelessness and who are experiencing poverty in some ways. So if we think about it in two ways, the first is, as a society, we don't know how to treat people who are experiencing poverty, and thus people who are homeless. We treat them as if it is only their fault and there is no systemic issue and they should be blamed. On the other hand, it is the psychology of the person who is homeless, who beat themselves up and engage in a way that is brutal to their own sort of psyche and self-development. This is understood if you've bought into the idea that America is a meritocracy and therefore your failure is only your fault. We'll get to that in a moment and we'll talk about meritocracy. The way to fix homelessness, and this is my overall thesis, cannot be that we become harder on the people who are already marginalized. There has to be some care and compassion. I will bring up meritocracy over and over and over again, correction by Grammarly, repeatedly. Because I think it is important that we contextualize why it is that the American ethos would have us believe that a person who has experienced poverty and homelessness should not be helped and that they are to be blamed for their own circumstances. I've listened to 
Iswa Klee from the New York Times podcast. I listen to this podcast a lot. You guys should definitely check it out. Um, it's a really good podcast from the New York Times. The discussion had to do with policymakers believing that laws are too lenient for people facing homelessness, which invites homeless people. California, by the way, was used as an example. And this is actually quite frustrating, where people thought those who were homeless were actually moving to California to get the benefit of the favorable policies. Thus, to prevent homelessness in the state, the policies, quote, have to be tougher on those experiencing homelessness as a sort of deterrent, as if people are making choices about where to go and when to move when they are homeless in order to benefit from the policies of the local government. This assertion is categorically false. People experiencing homelessness tend to be relatively stationary. The idea that you just need to make things harder for people experiencing homelessness and that making things harder will prevent them from being homeless is absolutely barbaric and wrong. The people claiming these methods are either ill-informed of the movement of those facing homelessness and those experiencing homelessness, or they are pretending to not understand the truth about the mobility of people facing homelessness or experiencing homelessness. This is absolutely diabolical. And the political activism to get tougher on those who are experiencing homeless, to get tougher on the homeless population is wrong. And the notions underpinning this kind of policy making is not accurate. So, I truly do understand, however, people who believe that homelessness brings in all kinds of crime and while they want those people to get help, those people do not have to be in our front yard. Well, I get the idea. I don't agree with it. It is dehumanizing and it lacks any kind of depth of analysis. So I think we should do the analysis. For this video, I will outline the topics in five parts, right? The first, which is the introduction, this is part of the introduction, so there's not much left here. Uh, part two is sort of understanding homelessness in the United States through the kind of three major states when it comes to homelessness, which are New York, California, and Florida. Uh, this is not going to be a comparative analysis. I will just use this as a way to analyze how the government, the local government in these areas, deal with the homeless population. Part three, we will analyze the sort of American and thus Western ethos around homelessness as sort of a personal issue as opposed to a systematic or systemic collective issue that needs to be solved, right? The collective consciousness places the idea around success and failure and thus homelessness um, as part of the meritocracy. Again, meritocracy comes directly into vogue in this part. Part four, we will discuss the Supreme Court case and the implication on the decision that I expect to come out this summer around homelessness and what local and state governments can do in order to remove the homeless population. Again, this is absolutely diabolical and I don't foresee see the Supreme Court upholding the right to shelter as fundamental. We will explain more of this when we get to that section. Then part five will be the conclusion. Here we will discuss the sort of suggestion for policy change and political activism, particularly in the general election. All right, so let's begin with homelessness and define it. So the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD for short, defines homelessness but breaks it down into four categories, right? The four categories are literally homeless, imminent risk of homelessness, homeless under other federal statutes, and finally, fleeing or attempting to flee DV, domestic violence. Policies addressing homelessness must contemplate all four areas for it to be effective. There is an opinion that I have that I will carry out throughout the video. While literal homelessness might be the direct portion of this discussion, all four will be somewhat implicated. To define literal homelessness, uh, we're going to put it from the HUD website up. HUD describes this as individual or families who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, meaning one, has a primary nighttime resident that is a public or private place not meant for human habitation, two, is living in a public or private operated shelter designated to provide temporary living arrangement, or three, exiting an institution where he or she has resided for 90 days or less and who resided in an emergency shelter or place not meant for human habitation immediately before entering that institution. Thus, homelessness 
is not just uh, an umbrella term, but rather it is broken down into different categories of homelessness. There are homeless, people experiencing homelessness, who are sheltered versus those who are unsheltered. This kind of distinction is important as we move forward. The idea that we need to posit is that all homeless people people facing homelessness or people experiencing homelessness should have shelter and thus be sheltered. The demographic is actually quite frightening when we zoom in to homelessness, right? And when we look at the demographic, according to the January 2022 pit count, there are almost 600,000 Americans who are experiencing homelessness across the US. This amounts to about 18 out of every one 10,000 people. The vast majority were individual adults, right? So this was about 72% that were individual adults who were facing and experiencing homelessness. 28% were families living with children. This is the important part for me. Now, I use the idea of children experiencing homelessness as the calling card because even if we believe that adults failed and thus they are deserving of what they get out of life and not needing any help from other people because they should pull themselves up from the bootstrap or by the bootstrap. It is important that we all agree that children do not fall into this category. And where there are children facing homelessness or experiencing homelessness, we now have an issue that is systemic. No child should be facing homelessness. Can we all agree to that? Can we all agree that there should be no child experiencing homelessness? All right, we good? All right, so let's move on. If we zoom in on the break racial breakdown, and I will flash that across the screen for you all, we note that African Americans are disproportionately represented in the racial breakdown, where we have 291,000 people who are white facing homelessness across America. The second largest population is black, African American, and we have 217 about roughly 217,000 people facing and experiencing homelessness. So while black people, and we'll keep the chart up for this section, while black people make up 13% of the US population, they also make up 30-ish percent of the homeless population. This is like not even, like this is ridiculous. And when it comes to families with children facing homelessness, the black population of families that are homeless make up 50% of homeless families with children. Black people make up 13% of the population, about 30% of the homeless population. And when we talk about homeless families with children, black people make up 50%? Oh yeah, that, this is obviously not just a general problem, but also a racial problem. And we'll get into that in more detail in a moment. The top three states, with the highest homelessness or the highest homeless population are California, New York, and Florida. We need to zoom in on these three different states and see how they deal with homelessness for any indication of what we should look forward to when it comes to the homeless population and how we help people who are experiencing homelessness. Not to mention that there is a current Supreme Court case, right? The Supreme Court justice are now deliberating and writing their opinion for the outcome of a case that will determine what states and local governments can do when they want to remove the homeless population can a state without providing adequate beds remove or make it illegal for people to sleep in public areas with blanket should should that be allowed should it not be allowed well we'll find out when we get to the supreme court case all right let's discuss further zooming in first on florida you should not be accosted by a homeless uh like we see you should be able to walk down the street and, and live your life we're going to have clean sidewalks, we're gonna have clean parks, we're gonna have safe streets. With over 30,000 people experiencing homelessness in the state of Florida, Florida has the third largest homeless population in the United States. 15,000 of which are unsheltered, where the other 15,000 is sheltered. The citation for all the information I provide will be below in the description. The state has also provided the nation's largest increase in families and children, and veterans, by the way, experiencing homelessness between 2022 to 2023. To address the homeless crisis in Florida, Governor DeSantis signed into law HB 1365. And this is just such a really 
sad bill, right? It prevents unauthorized public camping and public sleeping. And while a lot of people might hear that and think that's a good thing, it is fundamentally not. Um, so counties and municipalities um, can be sued by local businesses or individuals if they see there are unauthorized camping and sleeping in public areas. Now, this is important. Beginning in January 2025, so next year, the law will allow residents, local business owners, and the state attorney general to file suit to stop cities or the city from allowing homeless, the homeless, to camp or sleep on public property. To say this law lacks compassion would be an understatement. However, DeSantis indicated that the state would provide funds to help create designated area for camping zone. But like most things from Governor DeSantis, when it comes to helping people outside of the rich, there was no funding for this. There has been no funding. There's no talk of funding outside of the initial statement that the state government would provide local areas, local governments with the funding necessary to set up camping zones. The truth is, and this is the important part, there is no cure for the homeless. Rather, the bill is not about helping to fight homelessness. Rather, it is fighting the people facing homelessness, and they want to remove them from the population as they are an aesthetic inconvenience. This is what um, the report has to say. Now, when DeSantis initially backed this idea earlier in the year, he said the state might be able to help out with some funds to create those designated camping zones in cities and counties. But the state budget came and went, and we never saw an appropriation, meaning local governments may now be on the hook to create those designated zones, and it could be a sizable expense. We'll have to wait and see. All right, let's leave Florida and go all the way up to New York, drawing on Norm Siegel and Robert Hayes, who are the leading people attorneys in terms of homelessness and homeless policy in New York. Um, I will draw in, by the way, a lot on a New York Times interview done by Sam Roberts. It will also be linked down in the description. Mayor Adams is attempting to suspend the New York City right to shelter law. Uh, so Mayor Eric Adams asked a judge to let him suspend the city's 42-year-old obligation to provide a bed to anyone requesting it. The excuse he's giving for this is that the migrant crisis is overwhelming and thus the shelters and the shelter system have become overwhelmed and New York City cannot provide adequate beds for people seeking shelter. The suspension, therefore, is that New York City would lose its obligation, suspend its obligation to provide shelter. The judge actually agreed. It is imperative that we understand that suspending the obligation for a city to provide shelter to the people facing homelessness is absolutely absurd. And it's not because New York cannot afford it. And we'll get to afford in the conclusion. I think it is important when we're discussing what the US government and various state and city government can and cannot afford that we actually peel back the curtain and say you're a liar. Like, <laughs> it's just a lie. That we cannot house people who are unsheltered is an absolute lie. But let's move on. In a city of more than 3.3 million people, nearly one in every 83 New Yorker is homeless. Now, I would do the flip side to talk about how many New Yorkers have become multi-millionaire in the last year, but I'm just gonna leave that to your imagination or for your research. In the same city where thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are facing homelessness and high-level poverty, on the flip side, it is also the city with some of the wealthiest people in the world. The Gini coefficient is out of whack. So more than 100,000 men, women, and children are facing homelessness. More than 4,000 people are unsheltered in the subway on the street in Manhattan or in one of the other boroughs. Citations will be provided in the description and on the screen throughout the video. New York City, mind you, is attempting to bypass or suspend its obligation under the Callahan case. And this is Callahan versus Carey, which was decided in 1981. This case first helps us to understand that language matters. On one point, prior to 1981, we were calling people facing homelessness and experiencing homelessness derelict. 
And after this case, we move towards calling them people facing homelessness or, quote-unquote, the homeless. The case paved the way for future legal victories that ensure the right to shelter for homeless men, women, and children in New York, and also homeless families generally. So the issue here is if the Callahan case gave the right to shelter to people experiencing homelessness, the mayor right now is attempting to sidestep this obligation and have sidestepped this obligation, citing an overwhelming amount of migration, migrants rather, in New York, thus overwhelming the system. And New York cannot, New York City, cannot provide shelter because of the migrant crisis. We'll investigate that in another video, but for now, let's just move on from here. New York's homeless shelter population, um, when we think about a snapshot in 2023, the total number of people sleeping in New York's main municipal system, so both sheltered and unsheltered, go up by and due to 92,000 right? The number of homeless families is 23,000, over 23,000. The number of homeless children is over 33,000, right? The number of homeless adults in families are, is up over 35,000. The number of homeless single adults, 24,000. The number of homeless single men, 18,000. The number of homeless single women, 5,000. New York City Council is asking for change. And at least in writing, in their presentation, they are advocating for the people facing and experiencing homelessness to have a place to call home, or at least a place to sleep at night. Noting, and this, this is again from the New York City Council, the case for change. And let's read this letter in full, and then we'll figure out if they're abiding by it. Homelessness is a national problem that has reached a crisis level in New York City. If you live here, you encounter this reality every day, on the subway, on the street, at school, and at work. We interact with colleagues, friends, and neighbors who are experiencing or are at risk of homelessness. Everyone wants a safe home where they can rest their head at night. And everyone wants to experience the enormous possibilities of living in the greatest city in the world. But for approximately 80,000 of our fellow New Yorkers, realizing those possibilities is complicated by the experience of homelessness. Mind you, this has 80,000 where the actual number now in 2023 and 2024 is upwards of 90 as opposed to 80,000. We continue. We can no longer simply accept this reality. It requires urgent action. Unfortunately, our federal and state governments have failed to fulfill the roles they should play in alleviating poverty. While we must continue to raise our voices and advocate that they need, they meet their responsibilities to all of us, we as a city must act. We need to take immediate steps to provide appropriate services and support that enables people to exit homeless shelters and more quickly and easily or avoid them in the first place. We need to equip all street outreach teams with the tools and flexibility to bring unsheltered individuals inside. We also need a long-term vision that shifts resources to permanent, affordable housing and reduce the number of people who are homeless. Over the past year and a half, the City Council has engaged with a multitude of stakeholders and advocates. Their perspectives have been invaluable and have allowed us to develop the set of recommendations contained in this report. We want to thank each person who has shared their insights and experience with us. The development of this paper has been a team effort and it is that kind of collaboration that is essential to moving this work forward. Sincerely, Corey Johnson, Speaker. While the letter and the opening does a lot in terms of advocacy and putting punctuation, if you will, on the notion that homelessness is a system level crisis that need to be solved at that level, the system, and not necessarily just at the individual level. At least in words, the New York City Council want to do something about homelessness. However, will they engage meaningfully in the building of shelters and allowing for people to find a bed to rest at night? It is yet to be seen, but they're not doing a great job when the mayor is asking to suspend its obligation to provide shelter. That is absolutely absurd. 
So let's leave New York and go all the way to California where more than 171,000 people are experiencing homelessness. Now, California has 12% of the nation's population, yet it makes up 30% of the homeless population. And this moves up to 50% of the homeless population when we talk about those who are unhoused. So California makes up 12% of the US population, 30% of the overall homeless population, and 50% of the unhoused, unsheltered, homeless population. If we go to the New York Times, which, again, I reference the New York Times a lot because this is one of the very few plays in terms of publication, whether that be podcast or writing, where homelessness is taking center stage in terms of meaningful discussion with policy experts. So that's why I keep referencing New York Times articles, interviews, and podcasts. In a very recent podcast, Jerusalem Demsis explained that high housing costs lead to homelessness. This is not something that is very complicated. And I think it is important when we talk about high housing costs leading to homelessness, we consider that poverty in and of itself, right, is not the leading cause or the direct cause of homelessness. It has to be paired with a high housing cost because if we go to West Virginia where the poverty level is really high, the homeless level is really low. This was also discussed in the interview. And the question here now becomes, who experiences homelessness in California? Individuals with certain vulnerabilities, those with a history of trauma, and also racialized minorities are the people most at risk of facing homelessness. There's also members of the LGBT community who experience homelessness at a very high rate, not just in California, but all across the United States. Nine out of 10 participants in a widespread experiment done. This, by the way, is one of the largest investigation into homelessness that has ever been done in California. Um, I will link to this down below because it's actually quite fascinating and I think a lot more people should read it. This uncovered that when it comes to the participant, nine out of 10 participants in the survey, in the study, lost their housing in California. So 75% of participants lived in the same county as their last housing. This note, this fact might not be significant on its own unless and until we start to analyze the information coming from policymakers where policymakers believe that the issue with California law being too lenient is that it attracts people who are experiencing homelessness to come to the state and come to the local areas. This is not true. 75% of the people who are facing homelessness in a very specific area, county in this way, lost their job and became homeless in that area. They're stationary. They are not moving from one area to California to benefit from the lenient law. This is an absolute farce. And I think most policymakers know this, and they're only trying to incite a kind of political activism to be harsher on people facing and experiencing homelessness. High housing costs and low income left participants vulnerable to homelessness. One quarter, so about 26% of those assigned female at birth, 18 to 44 years, had been pregnant during their time being homeless. 8% reported that they were currently pregnant. Again, we're in the study, and the participant women, ages 18 to 44, have been pregnant during their time being homeless, or 8% are reportedly pregnant while being homeless. What happens to people? Who are homeless? I think this is a fundamental question that I ask in trying to answer a question to the research that was not included. Why are so many women pregnant when they are homeless? There's a lot of conjecture here and it's not quite, the answer is not as direct as one might think. I think the theory here is that a lot of these women end up in prostitution and thus they're pregnant because they don't have the correct kind of contraceptives to engage in the kind of labor that they engage in in order to provide for themselves. However, this does not capture all of the women who are pregnant when they were facing homelessness. There's a lot of trigger warning, RAPE, that happens with women who are the most vulnerable when they are homeless. Um, there's not a lot of protection and there's not a lot of care given to these women who are facing homelessness. This is actually a really sad reality and hopefully there is a political activation that occurs in people when they hear about how vulnerable people are being taken advantage of when they are outside in this way without any home to go back to.
Nearly three quarters um, of people facing homelessness and experiencing homelessness also experience physical violence in their lifetime. 24% experience sexual violence. Sexual violence was more common among cis women. And by the way, I know a lot of people don't like the cis and trans dichotomy. I understand that. I'm using a very scientific way of speaking because of the research that I'm indicating. So I just wanted to put that out there for people who may or may not be triggered. Sexual violence was more common among cis women, which at 43%, and transgender or non-binary individuals, 75%. Participant reported that homelessness left them more vulnerable to violence. More than one third of all participants, that is 38-ish percent, experienced either physical or sexual violence during this episode of homelessness. Women in the LGBT community, so transgender and binary, non-binary individuals, were more likely to experience sexual violence, as reported here. Fewer than half had received any formal assistance to re-enter housing during their episode of homelessness. This is also important because the laws that policymakers are arguing is too lenient doesn't actually help when fewer than 46% of people facing and experiencing homelessness have received any formal assistance to re-enter housing uh, during their time being homeless. Only 26% received assistance monthly or more frequently in the prior six months. Two-thirds of participants believe that their lack of assistance was a barrier to their re-entry into housing. All of this information, again, will be in the comments. Take a drive down Los Angeles' Skid Row, filled with tents, people, and growing frustration. If I can get back in to another uh, residence, then I won't make the same mistakes I made before. According to new federal data, a record number of people are now unhoused, more than 653,000, a 12% population increase since last year. Mel Tilakaratna runs a nonprofit that provides free showers to people living on the street. The system is completely overwhelmed. Tilakaratna points to a rise in housing costs, the opioid epidemic, mental health issues, and the migrant crisis as factors exacerbating the problem in LA. We have families, asylum seekers to families in LA who become homeless, and prior where we would be able to send them to a motel or a shelter within a couple of days, now there's absolutely no resources. These issues are also creating friction in major cities. Back in September, New York Mayor Eric Adams revealed new fears as tens of thousands of asylum seekers flooded the city. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. In Phoenix, the city recently cleared a large encampment located downtown. It seems that the quote-unquote cleanup that the city did just spread the mess out a lot further. People going through everyone's dumpsters, dragging stuff out into the streets. Across L.A., officials have tried to clear out encampments. They come here tents and then all your stuff will be gone. This year, Los Angeles County declared a state of emergency. Since then, officials say they have provided health services, counseling, substance abuse treatment, and found temporary housing for more than 15,000 people and permanent housing for more than 8,000. But even those resources are not enough for frustrated business owners like this woman who doesn't want to be identified. We'll feed them. We offer food. But if they don't want it, what can we do? It's very frustrating. They'll throw things at you and they'll grab you. A growing national problem that could take decades to fix. Dana Griffin, NBC News, Los Angeles. In California, Skid Row is used as an argument against helping people who are experiencing homelessness. Skid Row is also used an ex as an example of why you cannot and should not tolerate camping of homeless people in your area. The quote-unquote buying and selling of drug, illicit activity, stealing, leaving trash, violence and drug use and needles being open and on the ground are concerns brought forward in the conversation around Skid Row and why having a high homeless population able to camp in areas within your neighborhood is a bad thing. Share Micah, residents say it took the city three months to clean up this particular homeless encampment on Hollywood Boulevard near Taft. The problem is it seems to be slowly returning and when it does, it brings with it all kinds of illicit activity. A persistent problem plaguing neighborhoods around Hollywood and beyond. It starts with one tent and then they basically, you know, become a whole line of, you know, maybe five or six tents combined. Pre-cleanup, it was pretty dystopian. That's all I can say. It was like a Mad Max movie. This one was the worst. Homeless encampments like this one on Hollywood and Taft growing in size. Longtime resident Brian Winchell says while he sympathizes with those down on their luck, he says people in these encampments steal power from local buildings, leave behind mounds of trash, cause disruptions at all hours of the night, and most concerning of all, bring violence and drug buyers and sellers to the neighborhood. He's disappointed in city leadership too. We pay their paycheck. That's my big beef. 
We pay their paycheck, and they have failed miserably to provide a safe, place to have my house and to have my dwelling place. I've worked hard for it and so have my neighbors. And we all don't feel safe walking to the 7-Eleven. We are scared that we're going to step on a used syringe or there's human doo-doo everywhere. Another neighbor, Osco Acopian, took this video as LA City crews attempt to clear the tents and trash this week. Caution tape now surrounds the sidewalks, but the trend seems to be within a day or so, the encampment returns and continues to torment those who live here. So we called the 311 and we called the, you know, um, all the, the politicians that are, you know, in this district, and it's really very slow to respond with any kind of uh, action. Martha Burr has lived here for 30 years. She says there's a criminal component to this. Her elderly neighbor was actually mugged and attacked by a member of the encampment. So she hopes police take more of an active role. I mean, if, if we see them, you know, smoking crack and selling drugs, you know, continuously, uh, you know, I just wonder why the police couldn't do a little bit more to keep an eye on them. And we spoke to council member Soto Martinez's office today. It says it will continue to provide regular cleanings to this site. It also says it referred every single person to housing and they're ready to go as soon as beds open up. The problem is that uh, we don't exactly know when this will be. There are 3,000 homeless individuals in this district and only 400 beds to accommodate them. That's the very latest from Hollywood. I'm Rachel Menatoff. Share Micah back to you in the studio. One of the gentlemen in the video we just watched articulated, and I quote, I have worked hard for it, dot, dot, dot. This, I have worked hard for it, um, has a corollary, right? What is the corollary that comes to mind and the implication here when someone says, I have worked hard for it? The implication very directly is, and you haven't. The idea of a meritocracy comes directly into vogue and the conversation now has to get into the American ethos around why some people fail and why some people succeed. So let's have the discussion on meritocracy again. In his book, The Tyranny of Merit, Dr. Sundell, a professor at Harvard University who teaches philosophy and political science, made the following statement on page 24. It says, the problem with meritocracy is not only that the practice falls short of its ideal, if that were the case, the solution would consist in perfecting equality of opportunity, in seeking a society in which people could, whatever their starting point in life, truly rise as far as their efforts and talents would take them. But it is doubtful that even a perfect meritocracy would be satisfying, either morally or politically. This frames the way, Dr. Sandel, frames the way in which we are going to discuss meritocracy today. The idea of a meritocracy first came about, not the idea, but the phrase, the word meritocracy, from Michael Young in 1958 in his book, The Rise of the Meritocracy. Interestingly, people have taken the concept and idea around a meritocracy and made it the sort of ideal society we are Young was not explaining an, an ideal society when there was an explanation about a meritocracy. Rather, a meritocracy in his book was a dystopian reality. The rise of the meritocracy was a dystopian scenario. Meritocracy, in Young's mind, created hubris in the successful, humiliation among those who are at the bottom, and Young also described the people at the top as becoming ruthless and arrogant in its introduction, Young explains how sad and fragile a meritocracy would be. IQ would become the measure of worth and value of a person. The working class would be silenced as they would have no one to speak up for them. The people at the top would be there advocating for their own benefit. The people at the bottom would continuously be crushed and blame themselves. This was not the ideal world scenario. Young was creating for us a bleak future if we lead into meritocracy. So the idea that a meritocratic system would evolve and be conceptualized in all our collective consciousness as the best outcome is kind of wild when you think about where it came from and that the author was not for it at all, like not even in the least bit. In his book, The Merit, The Tyranny of Merit, which we opened with Dr. Sindel, um, Professor Sandel explained that we do not live in a meritocracy, and further, that even if we could achieve a meritocratic system, hmm, that this world would not be good. 
there's a ton of sort of moral implication and underpinning around a perfect meritocracy where people could rise based on their talent and achievement. I won't get into sort of the moral implication here. I think the cosmic skeptic in the discussion with Dr. Sindel did an amazing job. I will link that video down below. It's over an hour, but the entire thing is worth it. However, we can move to Bill Clinton's statement on a meritocracy in the way that we discuss America. And this comes down to a very specific question about education and how important education is. Before I get to Bill Clinton's quote, which should be flashing across the screen right now, I think it is important to underscore how important education is in contemporary society. I will take a pause here to remind you that if you want to climb out of poverty, one of the best indicator in doing so is an education. The question now is, should that be the case? We can discuss and engage in that meaningfully down in the comment section, but let's go to Brookings, right? According to Brookings, education and military service are the two factors most strongly associated with membership in an upward mobile trajectory group. Education is one of the most common and proven methods for attaining upward social mobility. Point blank and the period. Stepping out of this video into something very important to me and stating the following. Do not let anyone tell you that education doesn't matter in today's society. It is a lie. However, the access to education and the kinds of education you have access to does matter. A look at the Ivy League universities and you will find that the students from the top 1% make up more, right? There are more students from the top 1% than there are from the people from the bottom half of the income scale combined. Only 3% of students from the bottom quartile are in the top 100 universities. If the quality of education and the place you go to get educated matters, the fact that only 3% of the bottom quartile of the population, in terms of socioeconomic standing, are in the top 100 universities in the United States tells you all you need to know about the trajectory and quote-unquote upward mobility from people in the bottom quartile of the socioeconomic ladder. The thesis is that meritocracy is corrosive. Again, Dr. Sandel's thesis is that meritocracy is corrosive of the common good. Opportunities are not truly equal and we do not have a meritocracy. Now, it is important to note that I disagree with Dr. Sandel, Sandel in that if we could achieve a meritocracy, that that would be a bad thing. The question is, do we now have a meritocracy and can we achieve a meritocracy? The answer to both those questions for me is no and no. And thus, I don't get to the third question where if we had a meritocracy and if we have one, would that be an, a good thing? Again, the moral question was asked and answered in the Cosmic Skeptic interview linked down below with Dr. Sandel. However, the issue with believing we have a meritocracy when we do not is twofold on a societal level and an individual level. Let's take the individual level first and then generally speak about at a societal level. The people at the top will believe they deserve to be there because of their hard work. This Dr. Sandel calls meritocratic hubris, where we believe that it's based on our own merit and not help from other people, our own skills and talent, that we were able to move up the socioeconomic ladder, but more importantly, for people who didn't have to move up to remain in their position in the top or upper class of society. This is important. The fact that there are people who do not believe that they were born into wealth and thus they stay in wealth because of their access to wealth based on nothing that they could have done is kind of horrendous. I'm reminded of a statement by Willa Smith, beautiful young lady, absolutely adore her. But when she was asked about her nepotism, she tried to brush it off and pretend that she did not benefit from her parents' willingness to invest in her career. The idea that my talent got me here and not good luck is corrosive because if your talent got you where you needed to go and your hard work got you where you need to go, then what is the incentive to help people who are quote unquote failing? Are they failing because they don't work as hard or because they don't have as much talent? How do we investigate these ideas so that we can come up with a conclusion that is good for society?
Everyone having what they earned is therefore corrosive and lead us right into the discussion of homelessness. How much is a person willing to help someone when they believe the person in need put themselves in said need? Where we believe a person's action and only their action is what resulted in them being homeless. Who can provide the help and who is willing to provide the help of investing in people who they don't believe worked hard enough? How does this inform policy? Homelessness is a product of three things. These things were explained again in the New York Times, right? Um, and I'll play some of it here. So maybe a good opening question is, why is homelessness so concentrated in California? California has a lot of homeless people because California has really high housing costs. And places in the U.S. that see really high housing costs see higher rates of homelessness, even if they're colder, even if they have lower rates of poverty, even if they have lower rates of mental health affliction, even if they have the lower rates of opioid abuse. The very core question here is, is there a place affordable for people at very low incomes to live? And if there's not, you'll have high rates of homelessness. There are two framing devices that get used here that I think are helpful. So one is this idea that homelessness is the interaction of three things, structural conditions, so maybe high housing costs, things like that, the thickness of the social safety net, and then individual risk factors. That if you're an individual who maybe loses their job in a place with a great social safety net, probably don't become homeless. If you're somebody who has mental health issues in a place with a weak social safety net and high housing costs, you've got a pretty good chance of becoming homeless. Now, I don't fully agree with this framework. I see the outline as ways to conceptualize homelessness in a sort of uh, multi-prong analysis where, and I'm looking at their outline, which I completely disagree with, where the, the sort of musical cheers analogy is helpful as a sort of framework as opposed to one of the prongs, right? So we can think about structural conditions in the way the interviewers explained it, where we have social safety net and high housing costs, which would be helpful because if we have high housing costs, and no social safety net around poverty and homelessness, then the people who would experience homelessness would not be able to get back into housing, it's too high, and there wouldn't be any government program to help them. Agency, individual risk factors here, would be joblessness, health condition, which would also include mental health and lack of access to a good, strong family network, right? When we think about the kind of agency, the high risk factors, and we couple that with structural condition, i.e. high housing costs, and lack of social safety net, we create what I believe is a very, very ripe kind of system for homelessness and poverty generally. The musical cheer analogy that was used in the interview earlier. And then the other one is this idea that comes from this book, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, which is the, the musical chairs analogy, which I find pretty helpful for this. So do you want to go through that? Sure. So everyone, I'm sure, here has played musical chairs when they were young. And if you're observing kids now and they're playing musical chairs, right, you'll see as the chairs get removed from the game, the faster kids, the stronger kids, the more aggressive kids, kids who have more confidence are the ones who get left. You know, if you're a shy kid, you might just kind of give up. And if you're someone who has a broken leg, you're someone who's probably not going to make it to the last chair. And so there are a lot of things that go into who becomes the last person sitting in that wooden chair. But it's almost a ridiculous question to ask, like, why is there so much chairlessness in the game of musical chairs? It's because you put chairs if there were 10 chairs and there was a good amount of time and you were able to help people with their broken legs get into the chairs, then everyone has a chair. And the way this gets analogized into homelessness is that, of course, there are incredibly important individual stories for who becomes homeless. Why is it that Black people are overrepresented in homeless populations, people with disabilities, people with mental illnesses, trans youth? Why do you see that? Is tells you a story of vulnerability within society. But the core question is, they're actually just not in homes. And if you were to in a game of musical chairs, not allow anyone with a disability to play, make sure only confident kids could play, make sure only people with really high sprint times could play, there would still be a chairless person at the end of the day. The issue is, again, I've outlined the, the, the analogy and I'll discuss it while looking at it. The analogy works only if the homes are being removed and we do not have enough homes for people. Thus, the people who gain homes are those who can compete. The musical chairs analogy only works if we are removing homes. There's not enough homes. And the people competing to get homes are the most talented, stronger, better, all of that. They get homes. The issue here is we have enough homes. And so the musical chair analogy does not work. If the US government wanted, every single homeless person in America would be housed. They just don't want to. What happens to this analogy when we do have enough homes? 
They're just empty. The game Musical Cheers is defined by scarcity, where we have to remove access from one or more participant while the music stops and someone has to be without. Again, the analogy does not work because we don't have to play musical chairs with these homes where the government can provide, if they want, enough homes chairs in the game for everyone to sit down, i.e. have a home, when the music ends. Again, this does not work for me. And this is also not just a Republican issue. This is not just the Republicans are mean and the Democrats want to care and try to get people into homes. That's unfortunately or fortunately not the case. In Republican states and Democrat states, people seem to be in agreement that they want single family homes and they refuse to have affordable housing in their areas. We can go to this video and watch parts of it where we get the explanation that even in states and areas where all branches of government is operated, controlled by Democrats, they do not help the homelessness in ways that are, are useful. They do not provide homes and affordable homes for people who need it. There's a question I've had for a very long time and it has to do with this map. This is a map of the 18 states in the US where Democrats control the legislative and executive branches or else have some veto-proof majority in the legislature. Democrats in DC often blame the GOP for foiling their progressive vision. When middle class families see their taxes go up, they'll know Republicans are to blame. But if you zoom into these 18 states, there's effectively no Republicans standing in the way. So my question is, what do Democrats actually do when they have all the power? To answer this question, I teamed up with the Times editorial board writer, Binya Applebaum. Okay, you got my attention. He's been thinking about and writing books about and reporting on this topic for decades. I think, you know, Americans tend to view politics as a competition of us versus them. And, and they tend to think that if they would just get out of the way, then we can do the things that we want to do. There is no them standing in the way. There's just the we of Democrats and their supporters, and they get to decide what policy should look like in those states. And that is an opportunity for them to implement their vision. For this story, I also delved into this giant document. It is the 2020 Democratic Party platform. If you want to really understand what Democrats say they want, what their vision is for America, it's found inside of this document. This document serves as a guide. As we zoom into these states to answer this question, what do Democrats really do when they have all the power? Nearly 554,000 homeless people from the 25 wealthiest Americans shows they're paying little in income taxes compared to their fortunes, sometimes nothing at all. We cannot, in good faith, blame the Republican Party when House Democrats have a majority. There's still very intense segregation happening in all kinds of forms all over this country. And this brings into question and vogue whether or not the political parties even care about those facing and experiencing homelessness and poverty more broadly. It does not seem like our current political system engages in meaningful work around helping those who might need the most help. Rather, we give money to companies because they're too big to fail, or foreign allies because war. It is unfortunate that the people in the US who need the most help are pushed to the margins because we believe in a meritocracy so much so that we are unwilling to help those who cannot help themselves because they should be able to. Because we are where we are, not homeless, not facing poverty, because of the work we've done. When most of us did not move up in the middle class or up in the upper middle class or in the 1%. Most of us, for most of our life, were stagnant. We stayed where our family created a life for us. And when we move up, we move up with the help of a ton of people around us. It is not necessarily just because of our talent. People, the, when the top 1% occupy most of the classes in the Ivy League universities and get the best jobs after uni, it is not because they really worked hard for it, not to say they didn't work hard, but they didn't work harder than the people in the bottom quartile when it comes to socioeconomic standing. It is the luck of the draw that you were born into a privileged society, into a privileged family in a privileged socioeconomic area, and that should be taken into consideration. The meritocracy that we believe in in America is a myth. It is not real. And to believe that you are where you are only because you work hard and everyone who has failed has failed because they did not work as hard is not true. It is a lie you tell yourself to make yourself comfortable about where you are positioned. This, by the way, is not to say that some people did not move up and work hard. But hard work is not the end all when it comes to how people navigate and are situated sociopolitically and economically. 
And with that, we go into the court, the U.S. Supreme Court, in its discussion around homelessness and what should happen to homeless people. So let's talk about the Eighth Amendment and the U.S. Supreme Court, the decision the U.S. Supreme Court is going to have to make shortly. On Monday, April 22nd, 2024, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a case coming out of Grand Pass, Oregon, and they, the U.S. Supreme Court, will decide the fate of the homeless population in the United States. That is, the decision will be about how states and local governments get to engage with and treat their homeless population. So, to begin, let's look at the wording of the Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The cruel and unusual punishment is the hook for which the litigation to protect people experiencing homelessness is based. The question, and a threshold question for us to discuss below, is whether or not the Eighth Amendment is the correct place to argue on behalf of those experiencing homelessness that if they engage the state in criminalizing sleeping outside, this is in fact cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, let me know what you think down in the discussion, and I will also be down there going back and forth with you. Now, Let's look at Grant Pass, Oregon's statute that is in question. So, after amendments in January 2019, the Grant Pass Municipal Code prohibits in relevant parts, one, sleeping in public streets, alleyways, and sidewalks or in adjoining areas, two, camping on all public property, and three, parking vehicles overnight in Grand Pass Park. Now, homeless persons who could not find shelter were not permitted, therefore, to sleep in the parks and public areas if they had a blanket. So, the caveat here is, if it is dead cold, a person could get around this law by sleeping in the cold without blanket. I don't know what sense that makes, unless you are specifically attempting to target homeless people, which they are. We'll get to what the mayor had to say in a moment, but just have remember that caveat about sleeping with blanket versus sleeping without, because sleeping without blanket is permitted under this code. Anywho, the Grand Pass Municipal Code definition of camping included, and I quote, any place containing materials used for bedding purposes for the purpose of maintaining a temporary place to live. Camping did not require a tent or any other structure. So this is specifically getting to a comforter. That is it. If you're sleeping with something covering you, they can see that as camping, which is illegal under the code, and attempt to fine you after multiple fines. If you are still found to be sleeping outside, then you could be arrested for trespassing. So you can sleep outside, just not with a blanket. Violators were subject to fines. Repeated violators of park regulation could be barred from the city parks for 30 days, lest they be charged with criminal trespassing. Now, again, there is an entire discussion about what this was intended to do. Was this code intended to help those who are experiencing homelessness, or was it to push them off, further marginalize a group of people who have been marginalized. Uh, the mayor explained the purpose was to remove every, quote, homeless person and give them, quote, no public space. This came out in the oral arguments on April 22nd at the Supreme Court. However, the argument here would later evolve into the purpose of the statute is to clean the community and clean public space because of the criminal activities that comes with homelessness. The statute is an attempt to prevent said criminal activities from happening in the local community, Grand Pass. This is a very interesting take when it was obviously clear based on the mayor's assertion of why it was that the law was enacted, which is to remove homeless people. But we can't get too deep into that. We have to go now to the US Supreme Court and the arguments being posited. The fundamental case being used in this area is Robinson versus California. Let's now look at the analysis that the US Supreme Court is going to have to do. To do this, we have to first look at the Robinson versus California case, which was decided in 1962. In this case, the court looked at drug use, and in this specific, it's about narcotics, right? And so the court determined that status and conduct are two very different things. 
that the government can regulate conduct, but it cannot criminalize status. What that means in practical sense is the use of narcotics can be regulated, can be criminalized. However, being addicted to narcotics would be a status and that cannot be criminalized, right? So the status versus conduct dichotomy is absolutely important for the discussion that is being had around homelessness, whether or not Fundamentally, the question is whether or not sleeping outside as a person experiencing homelessness is a conduct or is it part of the homelessness status. Being homeless and sleeping outside, are they so intrinsically linked that regulating or criminalizing sleeping outside is itself criminalizing homelessness? Or the status versus conduct dichotomy, which was which came out of the Robinson case, highlighted for us the first real approach to understanding how the Eighth Amendment would apply in a case like this. If the legislature, local government, create a category of law that criminalizes status, this would be seen as cruel and unusual, and it is unconstitutional and not allowed, the law that is. So this is how we get to the Supreme Court arguing that sleeping outside or the criminalization of sleeping outside with a blanket is in fact cruel and unusual because it gets at the status and not conduct. This is important. Actually, let me know what you think at sort of first glance, first listening, is regulating sleeping outside, criminalizing sleeping outside with a blanket. Do you believe that is regulating a status? the person being homeless would be the status, or a conduct. Sleeping is in fact an action. The actus rea here is the sleeping. Regulating that is it so intrinsically linked to being homeless that it is in fact regulating the status. I think it's interesting. This is fundamentally the decision the court will have to make. It is important to note that at the time of Robinson, this is 1962, the idea of being addicted to drugs, addicted to narcotics, was not immutable. The idea that one could stop being addicted was paramount, right? Now, whether or not recovering ever ends is still up for questioning. I think this is important because it comes into vogue when we are trying to make a comparative analysis between sleeping outside being similar to drug use in the Robinson case. Sleeping outside, is this necessarily a part of being homeless and thus a part of the status. Is the ordinance in this way an attempt to circumvent the status prohibition by aiming at a conduct that is deeply linked to the status being criminalized? Is homelessness a status? That is also a threshold question. Is homelessness a status? One could argue that being homeless is a status, and probably we should discuss this in the comment and on the upcoming live. Should we consider being homeless a status in the way that we consider being addicted to narcotics a uh, status in the Robinson case? And if it is a status, is regulating sleeping or criminalizing sleeping outside, regulating and criminalizing a conduct and not a status? I think it's an interesting point. And as you listen to the oral arguments and the judge, I think you will, it'll become clear to you what your position is. Sleeping is a basic human attribute. We all do it or we would not be here. Therefore, criminalizing sleeping outside when a person does not have a home to go to seems barbaric. And when I say that, this is my own judgment. There is a question now about whether or not the state or local government has an obligation to first provide beds for people who are homeless before they can engage in criminalizing sleeping outside when someone is homeless. The issue here is Grand Pass does not have enough beds for its homeless population, and yet they are actually criminalizing sleeping outside with a blanket. The question now becomes, should this be allowed? The Supreme Court is going to decide on this case, which will determine how local government will ultimately treat their homeless population. Is preventing sleeping outside criminalizing a status again or a conduct. Sleeping outside is so closely linked to homelessness that if a person does not have shelter provided for them when they are homeless, due to the human nature, the biological reality here, no fault of their own, they would have to sleep outside. If you do not have shelter and this person does not have a home, they obviously have to sleep outside. If they do sleep outside, then they are going to be penalized and after being warned and ticketed, they might be put in prison. Is this cruel and unusual punishment? The conduct, therefore, for me, let's 
put my own thoughts out there. I think sleeping outside while being homeless, this conduct collapses into the status, making them inseparable. Where the community does not provide shelter, it is cruel and unusual in my book to criminalize the sleeping outside if you are not providing the shelter. Now, do I think this is how the court is going to come out? I do not. I don't. The reason I don't is because this is going to be seen as conduct, and this is a problem. This is a very deep problem. When you listen to the judges talk to each other through the attorney, because this is what tends to happen at the, the Supreme Court, it is very clear where some of these judges stand. The city, mind you, the city, Grand Pass, is arguing this sleeping outside when you are homeless is conduct and not status, and thus they are not criminalizing a status, i.e. being homeless, but rather they are criminalizing a conduct, the sleeping outside. To my surprise, actually, Justice Kavanaugh came through with an important question that gave me hope that this could go in favor of those facing homelessness. And I will play Justice Kavanaugh's question and back and forth a little bit right here. People have all sorts of circumstances. It's very complex, and the individual how does it help decisions. If they're not, how, how does it help uh, the rule here, the law here? How does it help if there are not enough beds for the number of homeless people in the jurisdiction? So for Ms. Johnson, she sometimes stays with a friend. So how there are more, other... More generally, though, yes. I, I guess if there's a mismatch between the number of beds available in shelters, even including gospel rescue, um, and the number of homeless people, there are going to be a certain number of people who there's nowhere to go. That That is a difficult policy question. And we how does this law yes. deal, it, help with that policy? So it encourages people to accept alternatives when they come up so that fewer people end up camping. It also, there is harm in simply camping. Whatever materials people are using when they are living in public spaces without plumbing and infrastructure, there's harm to the whole city and to the whole community as well as to them. We know that, that encampments and these conditions also breed crime and very dangerous conditions. So the city has an interest in protecting everyone. Do you, do you think the constitutional rule should be different when the number of beds available in the jurisdiction uh, exceeds the number of uh, homeless people versus uh, the number of uh, homeless people exceeds the number of beds available in shelters? No, that's what we've seen in the Ninth Circuit. We've seen that that is unworkable. There is no way to count what beds are available and who is perhaps uh, willing to take one and who would consider it adequate. Then the question becomes, are those beds adequate? So here, gospel rescue well, mission. That's a separate yeah. issue, I agree. Um, it is. And, and it can be a, uh, a challenging issue, I suppose. So. Then, Justice Barrett follows up with the city claims that they are trying to, quote-unquote, save lives of homeless people. And this is important. I will also put her clip in because, again, these are not justices that I think will be on the side of the people experiencing homelessness, but I found it really interesting the kinds of questions that were being asked. So here is what Justice Barrett had to ask and the kind of response. Justice Barrett? So let me follow up on that. So you're saying there are services available, there's treatment available. So people would ultimately move off the street? Is that is that what you're saying? Because I think part of the premise of all of this, right, is that there are not enough beds for homeless people to occupy. And so there will be a mismatch and there are going to be some people who can't be cared for. Are you saying that if your law is in force, there is a way for everyone to be cared for? No, I'm saying that's a policy question that is quite difficult. But these laws are an important part of the puzzle. They're not the only solution. And we don't, uh, we don't believe that they are, but we think they're an important tool. And without them, we've seen what's happened on our streets. We've seen that people are, are dying in encampments. We've seen that cities are, are being forced to cede all of their public spaces. So that ultimate question is for the legislature and policymakers to figure out what the right solution, what the right mix of policies is. But the wrong answer is to do what the Ninth Circuit did here and to okay. Let me, let me just interrupt you there. You're right, it's a very, very difficult policy question. And I asked you before about whether this was just about blankets or whether it went into having fires or urinating and defecating outdoors and that sort of thing. And Justice Sotomayor pointed out that this particular injunction did carve out those things and was just talking about sleep. But, you know, other cases have been litigated in the Ninth Circuit that have gone beyond that. And because the line is things that are involuntary, that are human needs, it can, it can extend. It's difficult to draw the line. And whatever we decide here about this case is about the line. So can you describe for me some of the things that are difficult to figure out about the line? They're sleeping. They're sleeping with blankets. What else? Public urination and defecation, that is a serious problem. Those are parts of 
biological necessities of being human, a court in Sacramento um, addressed that, and the Ninth Circuit's opinions debated whether its rule would actually reach those things. I think any rule that we are wondering about and debating whether it would go that far, I think that is a sign that it is not a workable rule. The slippery slope here is very real. It's not just for camping and conduct that might be a biological necessity, putting aside tents and fires and cold climates. What other things would be allowed? All of the things that a human needs to survive, for example, potentially come into focus under the Ninth Circuit's rule, but also in other areas. Someone could say that my drug use or possession is the other side of the coin because I'm an addict or because I, a person who um, it violates other laws could say that I had a compulsion to do those things that I couldn't control. And the plurality opinion in Powell addressed that very thing and why it's so important to draw the line there. And when conduct is involved and once the court gets into deciding which conduct may be excused under the Eighth Amendment, it is so far afield of what the Eighth Amendment was ever understood to address. Okay, speaking of status and conduct, you've, you've argued that Robinson was wrong and we don't need to overrule it, and I agree. I don't I don't think we should overrule Robinson. Um, you've also been kind of resisting the status, you've been resisting characterizing anything other than the drug addiction that was at issue in Robinson as status. So what if the law said it is unlawful and punishable by 30 days in prison to have the status of homelessness? Just go with me, just assume that the law defines homelessness as a status and it is a status. Would Robinson say that that law is unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment? Would you concede that? And, and you're saying that that is a status? Yes, um, the law defines it as the... a status, and it's a status. Well, yes, and I think it looks a lot like Robinson under that hypothetical, but of course we disagree that it is I understand you disagree, but you are accepting that, that, that Robinson draws a distinction between status and conduct, and you're just fighting about the definition of a status? It, it draws the line where a law has no actus reus, so I think that's the easiest line. I, I don't defend the line under the Eighth Amendment because I don't think actually that the court, I know the court didn't rely on any Eighth Amendment principles or But the hypothetical I just gave you had no actus reus either. It's the status of homelessness. I mean, it could be, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon and the person is just standing outside the bus stop. Do you agree that if the law prohibited that, made that a crime, that under Robinson, whether Robinson was right or wrong, that under Robinson that would be a violation of the Eighth Amendment? Well, I, I, I think the better framework is due process. I understand and that. <laughs> under Robinson, do you agree that that would be wrong? Yes. Okay, thank you. The question was, she, look, are, are you saying there are services available for those experiencing homelessness while you're talking about this is going to help those facing homelessness? The city's answer is, ah, uh, no. So how are you going to pretend like a law pushing the homeless population out of the community, criminalizing them for sleeping outside, is in fact to help them, that they will get support and they will go to find shelter and be cared for while you don't have shelter or programs in place to help the people? How can one argue that the city is attempting to help those experiencing homelessness and that this law will drive them to get help when there is no help even if they... The fact that the attorney for the city could not answer the question until the bitter end regarding status outlawed being illegal as unconstitutional in that back and forth, by the way, is absolutely annoying. Because that wouldn't have been giving away ground. In any case, uh, Justice Jackson, um, let me play that right here and then we'll discuss in a small, uh, small bit. Justice Jackson? So, picking up where uh, Justice Barrett left off, you, you, you say that the ordinance here pertains to conduct and not to status, and I'm just trying to figure that out. Uh, I'm not so sure for this reason. It's because all humans engage in the act in question, sleeping. And yet, the statute operates, or the ordinance operates, to penalize only certain individuals, those who have no choice but to do that act in public. So it appears, I think, not to be the act that the state, or the city in this case, finds criminally culpable. Um, it's instead the act as engaged in by certain people, by people who cannot afford housing and have nowhere else to go. So why is that the wrong way to think about it? And if that is the right way to think about it, why isn't that a status crime in the way that Robinson contemplates? It's not because we can look at the law and it has a conduct element. The conduct is establishing a place, a campsite. And that is something that a person who has a home but, or a But you've just defined well. away the, the basic actus reus, right? The actus reus is sleeping outside, I guess outside to the extent you put outside in it, but that's the problem I'm talking about. The actus reus is the sleeping. Right? Everybody, that's not a criminally culpable kind of activity. 
um, that's what I think might distinguish it from Robinson and, and make it worse for you in a way. Because in Robinson, at least, to the extent someone had a disease, and the question was, well, are they engaging in otherwise criminally culpable conduct, buying and selling drugs, taking drugs? You know, we, we look at that kind of category of things. Here, the actus reus is sleeping. Human, universal. The, 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 the city adds, OK, but you can't sleep outside. And I guess what I'm trying to understand is, to the extent that that only happens with respect to a certain category of people who have no other place to go, why isn't that really just punishing the status of being someone who doesn't have any place to go? It doesn't apply only to that, those people. The respondents here are trying to exempt a whole category of people. What, uh, so what you look at there is the, the conduct of camping under federal law and in this court's decision in Clark, it was understood that that is conduct. It is just like trespass, where if you are found in a place, if you enter with permission, but then you remain there without permission under quarrels. But it's not just like trespass, because presumably you have other places to go. So let me just, let me just ask you this other question. What, what is your understanding of the Martin rule? Um, because I, I thought it was premised on the circumstance in which someone had nowhere else to go and they needed to sleep and they needed to be there, but you seem to suggest that necessity is not sort of baked into what Martin was doing. Martin speaks in terms of someone who is involuntarily homeless, and that raises all of those policy questions that we've been discussing about but how But assume they exist. In, involuntarily homeless means the person has nowhere else to sleep. Yes, that is. Of the necessity defense is available, and what respondents are asking to do is to constitutionalize that very defense under the Eighth Amendment. So as I said earlier, it could be, um, the argument could be made, it would be a very high bar under due process, but that is the sort of argument that we would expect one to make under a due process framework Thank you. under this court's Kaler decision. Thank you, counsel. So the conduct rest of status discussion, as you heard, has to do with first, all people sleep. And whether or not you sleep with a blanket is determinative in this case. So if you are outside and you're sleeping, you're fine. If you don't sleep with a blanket, the minute you put on a blanket, it becomes a problem. Certain people without homes have to sleep outside. So sleeping is something we all do. If you don't have a home, you still have to sleep. How is this not criminalizing the status? If a person, be, by virtue of being human, has to sleep. If they don't have a home and there is not a shelter, remember, they still have to sleep. So where are they going to sleep? Well, outside. If you criminalize them sleeping outside, you are virtually criminalizing homelessness. Now, do I think this is how the court is going to see it? How Justice Jackson is engaging? I don't think so. And I keep reminding you all that I do not think this is going to go in favor of those experiencing homelessness. Now, there is a question about the involuntary being involuntarily homeless and thus having a kind of necessity defense. I'm not going to engage with that too much here because that requires the person already experiencing homelessness to be locked up and then during their trial they will try to evoke the necessity defense. At that point, there's, they've been through the system, their lives have been ruined even further, they're further marginalized because no longer are they just homeless now, they're engaging in a way that disenfranchises them even further within the criminal justice system, and this is absolutely wild. The question here is, and I think this is important, should a local government, the state, or even the federal government have a responsibility to provide shelter for those who are in fact experiencing homelessness? Is the community, is pushing people out of their community when they experience homelessness to go find shelter something that we are willing to say is okay? Or are we saying because a person belongs to a community, the community also have a responsibility to take care of its members? I believe that the US government and the community does have an obligation to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. The question for me here is, does adding the universal biological necessity to the law, like sleeping, make it conduct-based as opposed to status-based? We look to the purpose and the effect to answer this question. Is there any meaningful difference between saying being homeless is illegal and being homeless while sleeping and breathing is illegal? This is fundamentally the question. Is there a meaningful difference if you're saying this is conduct versus status? By outright saying being homeless is illegal versus, oh, being homeless is not illegal, but if you sleep outside, that is illegal. Is there a fundamental difference there where one can say this is so strictly conduct that is not related to the status that it is not itself the status? Actually, I want to hear your opinion on this. The question and answer around police discretion is absolutely wild to me. I do not trust generally police discretion, particularly when it comes to engaging with people who do not have power. 
societal power, i.e. people who are experiencing homelessness. I do not believe, and the court have made various decisions along the lines, this line, that you get to, as a local government, a city or a state, push the people who are experiencing poverty to the other community or the other state. The Edwards versus California 1941 Dormant Commerce Clause case made it a crime to transport an indigent person. History and transition as a country is to is emphatically reject local legislative scheme that has the effect of pushing the burden of poverty and indigency into other communities. Um, we see this in Sense versus Roe. This can also be see, found in the Privileges and Immunities Clause. It can be found in the Dormant Commerce Clause. And it can also be found in the Procedural Due Process Clause of the, the Constitution. Now, when we're thinking about this, the whole point and the scheme is that states and governments aren't allowed to push poverty and people who are experiencing poverty over to their neighboring community. You have to deal with that as a specific state. Again, I don't want to get into the necessity defense, but the Martin case, a person cannot, the necessity defense ultimately says that a person cannot comply because there are no alternatives. Therefore, the fact that the law makes this illegal does not and should not be applied to a person because they had no alternative but to engage in the action that was claimed as illegal. And this has obviously constitutional origin. Does it make a difference if the city had enough beds for people who are facing and experiencing homelessness? For them to be able to remove people and make it illegal for people who are experiencing homelessness to sleep outside, Shouldn't they, the city, have a responsibility to provide adequate beds and shelters for these people to go before they can criminalize this conduct? And because this conduct is a biological necessity for all humans, isn't this creating a law that circumvents the responsibility to not criminalize a status? You are getting to the status by addressing a conduct that is so deeply linked to the status of being homeless. And does that matter? Does it matter how deeply or not deeply linked the, the conduct is to the status if in fact the law is specifically going at conduct, sleeping outside, and not status? That's an interesting point, and I do hope that we get into this more. I believe this is an attempt at criminalizing homelessness and not just sleeping. And thus, it is so deeply linked to the status of the person experiencing homelessness that it is criminalizing the homeless population. All right, that out of the way, let's get to this conclusion. With the lack of political activism around protecting those who are vulnerable, in this case, those who are experiencing homelessness, I do not see how this case will go in favor of those who are experiencing homelessness. In the beginning, and as I get through this conclusion, I'm reminded of the story of myself coming to the US and the fact that I believe at that point that there were no homeless people in the United States. I was misinformed and ignorant, but I wasn't completely wrong about the status of the United States government and its capacity to actually create a better living environment for those who are its citizens. While there are homeless people, thus I was wrong. The US government, if we look to its spending, the military spending or foreign aid spending, or even the spending to bail out large companies from going bankrupt, the finance is there. The political will, however, is not. The people who are often at the margins of society do not have the political pull or power or voice to engage in the kind of advocacy required to activate people who have power to engage in creating a better life for them. The problem is multifold, and I do not want any of this to ignore the fact that sometimes individual choices can lead to homelessness. I don't know if this is the majority of the cases. I don't actually care if this is the majority of the cases. When we have veterans, children, and those who are facing mental illness homeless, without care, this 
is a societal problem. It does not matter, from my perspective, what you believe about the meritocracy that you want to believe you live in. We need to help. And by we, I'm not talking to you individually. I'm talking about the government's responsibility to its citizens, whether we are speaking at the local or the national level. It is absolutely abhorrent and barbaric to be in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and there are people who are experiencing homelessness, upwards of 500,000, almost 600,000. This is absolutely absurd. And it's not because we don't have the beds, it's not because we don't have the buildings, it's not because we don't have the finances, it's just that we don't have the will to care. It's the ethos that you are where you are because of the way you engage in your life and thus you are to be blamed. Except this does not work when we're talking about children. This does not work when we're talking about the elder. It does not work when we're talking about the people who are sick. It does not work when we're talking about families who have been dislocated for natural because of natural disasters. There are things we can do. And here, for example, is what the Catholic Church in Florida is doing, what groups believe that they can do and follow. So I'll play this video and then we'll get into some policy decisions that we need to engage with. Narciso Munoz's daytime job is in finance, and he admits that he didn't always have such a kind view of the poor. I used to, to judge people, you know, for the money that they have, for how they dress, whatever. And sometimes, as we met with this uh, the Dominican man, no? who is a good father, who is a good man? He's, he's doing everything for his kid. Now, for the past seven years, his ministry has helped hundreds of people on the streets of Miami. Basically, what we try to, to give is give some dignity to the people that are on the streets, you know, and empower them to make a change. Noticing that one of the biggest challenges to people on the street was getting back into the housing system, Narciso had the idea to rent houses in different parts of the city where the homeless could live together as housemates and under supervision, support each other to overcome their addictions and other challenges. It's late in the evening and in one of the houses a group of men are sitting around a table and having a weekly support meeting, talking openly and honestly about the struggles they've faced that week. One of the men living in the house is Anders, who is from Miami but lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a number of years. 20 years of drinking. Oh really? Yeah. So it's time to put a stop to it. And what kind of problems did the drinking lead to? Um, lots of jobs, lots of family connections, um, lots of home. You know, it was, it was just one problem after another. Anders says he drank away everything in his life and had reached rock bottom. Oh, I was scared, I was terrified. You know, it was like one of those where you just don't want to live anymore. Another one of the houses has 10 men living in it. They're all expected to be self-sufficient, pay a portion of the rent and help with the upkeep of the house. This gives them a sense of ownership and responsibility. Lewis is from Puerto Rico and is one of the residents who came here from the streets. Nobody wants to live in the streets. I just thank God every day that I'm here. I got a house, I got a roof, I got a bed, I got a place to cook, I got good roommates, you know. It's like another family, you know. For those who are saying this is a Democrat or Republican issue, it's not. It's both parties needing to do better, both Democrats and Republican. As we go to the Benoff Homeless and Housing Initiative, we can go to the policy recommendation and I'll have them flash across the screen. One, increase access to housing affordable to extremely low income households. Two, expand target homelessness prevention. Uh, three, provide robust support to match the behavioral health needs of the population. Four, increase household income through evidence-based employment supports. Five, increase outreach and service delivery to people experiencing homelessness. And six, embed a racial equity program in all aspects of homeless system and service delivery. Now, a lot of people might have concerns about equity and all of that. We don't actually have to use that language. We don't actually have to engage that way. We can just have a broad rule around homelessness regardless of anything having to do with equity. I could have ignored it, but I included it because it's so fundamentally important to note that disproportionately the people facing homelessness are people who are minority and who've already been marginalized, whether this is about the LGBT community, whether this is the black community, the Native American community, women and children, and minority groups of men. It is important to note the people who are most likely 
to experience homelessness, looking at the risk factors for those who might become homeless. We now have an obligation, knowing the problem is a very small part of the battle. The other part is to advocate on behalf of those who might not have it to advocate for themselves. We are, as I'm making this video, heading into a general election. We're already there, actually. It doesn't feel that way because one person running for president, the current president, is pretty much nowhere to be found, and the other candidate is fighting because he paid off a P star, and there's a bunch of other cases that he's fighting. The issue is, regardless of how we come out, we are going to have to face the fact that homelessness is a problem. And it is a problem that should be at the forefront of the agenda setting. In the debates to come, the question of what to do about homelessness should be front and center. Candidates for national office, candidates for local office, should not get to escape being asked questions and required to answer about how they deal with some of the most marginalized people in their community, be that America as a whole or a state more locally. I think it is important to make the agenda setting about some of the things we are concerned with, and I do hope that homelessness is something that more of us become concerned with. It is sad, again, that in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, there are people who are experiencing poverty on a level that is so inhumane that they cannot afford shelter, food, or clothing. It is our responsibility to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. And again, I don't mean that individually. It is okay that you are also struggling. I am not asking you to give everything you have. I'm telling you that the government that we pay into has an obligation to the people who it is to protect. And if it cannot do right by those people who need it the most, that's the problem. I hope you see that too. We're going to have multiple live streams. You will be able to test whatever ideas I have. You can push back. But please, as we continue this discussion, please understand that this is sensitive and we're talking about people's lives and we should approach it with a ton of empathy. All right, I will end it here. Remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you all later. Thank you. And Alicia, thank you so, so much. I truly appreciate you igniting or reigniting the fire that we need to have these conversations around poverty generally and homelessness more specifically. So have a wonderful night, and I will see you all later. Bye.